now it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie. She's been concerned about what I might say. Uh, Jackie Pye began her career in mental health as a forensic counselor working with young offenders. I think that experience uh, kind of encouraged her and got her to go uh, back to school where she actually got her PhD on memory impairment and fetal alcohol spectrum. Now she also has a private practice as a registered psychologist uh, specializing in neuropsychological assessment. Jackie has also worked with the Glen Rose Hospital FASD diagnostic team and teaches psychology at several post-secondary institutions. Jackie holds a number of key positions that, which allow her passion for bringing together both research and clinical practice um, that make a difference for those living with FASD. These positions include assistant professor at the Department of Educational Psychology at the U of A, uh, assistant clinical professor at Department of Pediatrics at the U of A. She's also the lead for the Canada Northwest ne uh, Research Network Intervention, NAT, and most recently has taken on the role of co-chair of the Alberta Supports for Services and Intervention Community of Practice Council. So, as you can see, she's a very busy lady, and despite her many accomplishments, Jackie remains very grounded. She has <clears throat> a wonderful sense of humor and maintains <clears throat> that her husband and children are the center of her life. It has been my pleasure to work with Jackie on a number of occasions, and I know by the end of this presentation, you will feel that you have invested your time wisely. Please join me in welcoming Jackie Pye. Wow, that was kind of nice. I feel like there's high expectations now. I'm a little nervous. I was okay before that. Thank you, Jerry. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about FASD and specifically try to consider some of the implications for you guys and your work as probation officers. So I've, what I've done is I'm going to try to give us um, a little bit of you know, overview is what's going on with FASD. I don't want to talk a lot about it, but I want to get a bit of overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens to the brain when alcohol um, affects the brain and how that is affecting what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, oh, I'm moving up and down over there. It's all right, a little distracting. Um, and uh, um, we're going to talk about some of the key issues that you guys might see. And then we're going to talk about some strategies. And these are some strategies that I've kind of come up with or are thinking about. But I'm also going to be really interested to hear the questions that you guys might have. I really have no delusions as to my ability to answer all of your questions today. Rather, I want to open a bit of a discussion, give you some information that I hope is useful, and maybe address some questions that you guys have that we can really sort of consider what makes sense. So as we get started, let's start with um, what is FASD and, and just make sure we're on the same page. And this is just sort of a, a really brief sense that we want to know what we're talking about. So when we say FASD, we're talking about brain injury to a developing brain. So this is brain injury. At its roots, at its core, we're talking about a pattern of brain injury, and that's something I'll talk more about. This brain injury is caused by exposure to alcohol in utero. So a mom has to drink during pregnancy for us to be looking at FASD. These are sort of the, the bottom lines. This can look very different in different individuals depending on the amount of alcohol and the pattern of exposure during pregnancy, the brain can be affected in very different ways. So the type of brain injury can be very different for different people. So what you guys see can look really different. So you can have two different individuals in your work, both with an FASD diagnosis, and they may present entirely different. This is the challenge of working, doing this work. What works for one of these individuals may not work for the other individual. And you are going to be constantly adapting and shifting. And that's more of what we'll talk about today. I put in there a consistent pattern of inconsistencies. That's sort of a catchphrase that is sometimes used when we're talking about some of the individuals you might work with. In that one day things seem to work, one day they don't. One thing, day you think you're on track, one day you don't. Um, one person is one way, one person is another way. Every time you think you got it figured out, Every time you think you've got the balancing act down and you're like, yeah, okay, I've got it, guess what? The next day you'll be like, oh, it's gone again. 
And that's even in, in terms of practice, in terms of the work you do, that's one of the, the most frustrating or challenging aspects that I think that we face is that, you know, for myself, I'll, I'll get excited. I'll say, yeah, I've got it. I've got it figured out. We've got a plan. Things are moving. We're doing good. And then the next came, come, day comes along and everything kind of falls apart. And it's like, oh, man, how did I miss it? And that's because we're dealing with a brain that is actually functioning a little bit different from day to day. And so that shifting and adapt, adaptation is just part of what we need to do. So I'm going to just start by how it's diagnosed. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the diagnostic process today. That's not why we're here. But I want to hit on a few key things. First of all, just to kind of underscore the fact that this is a complex issue, this is a diagnosis that is best undertaken by a team. And so there are actually a group of people that get together and consider the amount of impact and the type of impact. And it's just that when we're talking about this kind of brain injury, there is a lot of different areas of function that can be affected, and it crosses more than one area of specialization in terms of assessment. And so team diagnosis is optimal. Having access to that information in your roles, and I think there might be varying uh, degrees of ability to get to that information, is helpful because there is a lot of information from a lot of different professionals when they've been through that team uh, assessment process. So in the assessment, there are really three key clinical areas that we look at, or three key clinical indicators that we're dealing with an individual affected by FASD. Those are growth deficiencies, facial dysmorphology, so effects to the face, and brain injury. So looking at the first one, I'm just going to put up this slide. Um, This is just sort of a picture of, um, and it's in a child, you'll notice it's in a child, of the typical facial features that may be seen in an individual affected by FASD. Now, a few cautions here. First of all, the majority of individuals who are diagnosed with an FASD do not present with any facial features whatsoever. They look just typically developing in terms of their facial features. And those individuals who as a child may have had some facial features, as an adult, no longer do. So there is some growth that takes place in maturation that any of these features that may have been present may be gone in adulthood. So meeting an adult and you look at their face and you go, oh, their face looks fine. Well, they may have never had the features or they may have grown out of the features. In other words, it's not really a useful piece of information is what I'm saying. Growth also not a particularly useful piece of information. The vast majority of kids are typically developing in terms of their growth. The majority of kids um, are born at typical weights or even big. And so growth is not a good indicator. And again, like the face, even if they start out small, a lot of them will also do some catch-up growth and as an adult are not particularly small and there's not really any clues in terms of size that are going to help you. So bottom line, growth not all that useful in terms of information. So three key criteria, and I've just said that they're not necessary for a diagnosis of FASD. You're not always going to see them. In fact, in most cases, you will not see them. They're not necessarily indicators of severity, meaning whether they're there and whether they're not, are not good indicators for you to say, is this person affected severely? Do they have a severe brain injury or not? They're not great pieces of information. They're not useful pieces of information. So um, I've kind of taken two of our three key criteria and already removed them from the table. What does that leave? That leaves brain. And brain is the part that we're going to talk about today because brain is the part that impacts function. Brain is that, you know, mechanics that lead to the kinds of things that we see in a day-to-day basis, not the growth and not the face. So you see my lovely brain picture that I have there or on your slides if you're looking at your slides or your handouts. Um, On the right, you see the smaller brain, which is a brain that has been affected by alcohol in utero. Most brains do not look like that even when they've been affected by alcohol. So that's a fairly extreme version, but it's just an illustration of some of the evidence that says, yes, we know that when a baby is exposed to alcohol in utero, it definitely affects the brain, and depending on the extent to which they're exposed, we can see some really significant malformation. Now, let's just kind of talk a little bit about how alcohol affects the brain, because I think that's where it gets interesting when we start to think about function. Excellent. So the brain, when it's developing in utero, we sort of start like in a tube. We start in close. And it grows out, kind of like a 
cauliflower. Have you ever seen cauliflower grow or something like that where it grows out? So structures start from the inside and they move out. And all these little nerve cells, like those kind of things with all these arms, it almost looks like a spider webby thing, grow outward from that core. Okay, they kind of climb up these little, um, well, they, they kind of climb up each other essentially, and they move outward, and the brain sort of grows in structure through development. So when we introduce alcohol to that process of this brain growing from here to here, what happens is we see that some of the core functions are most likely to be preserved because they're sort of closer in. But the alcohol comes in and all these nerve cells, all these neurons, all those spidery little things that you were seeing there, they're trying to get where they're going. They're climbing up and sort of like they're climbing up little ladders to get to where they're going. But then we introduce alcohol. Whoa, they're confused. They don't know where they're going anymore. And these nerve cells end up going up the wrong ladder. They go to the wrong place. They're not sure what they're supposed to be doing. They're confused. So the brain is disorganized at a really basic level. So the basic little Lego blocks that are going into constructing that structure that is our brain are mixed up. It's supposed to be here, it's over here. It's supposed to be here, it's over here. So if you look at that brain, it may look just fine. Yeah, I look at it, it looks okay. But when we look at the function, we discover that, wow, things are not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not located where they're supposed to be located. The other thing we know is that because it's this process of growing out, the further that nerve cell had to travel to get to where it was supposed to be, the more likely it is to be affected because there's more time that's involved in that travel. There's more distance it had to cover. So the further away from the core we get, the more likely we are to have a problem. That's when we start to think about the structure of the brain. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if you're close to the core, you're close to home, you're more likely to, to be okay. The further you get from home, the more likely we are to have problems or injury or disorganization in that brain. So what functions are at the core and what functions are way out here? Let's take a look. This is sort of one view or one structural understanding of the brain. The first sort of core part of the brain you see is sort of this brain stem, and we call that kind of the reptilian brain, really. And it's essentially our functional brain. It keeps our heart beating, keeps us breathing. If that part of your brain isn't working, then we won't be here. So that's really fundamental. So we know that part of the brain is working because this person's sitting in front of you. Then we got up to the next part of the brain. So we just crawled out into this next layer. And we're looking at sort of the limbic brain, we call it. And this is the part of our brain that's responsible for emotions and emotional learning right in between the brain stem. So if we look right in between those two, in between the brain stem and the limbic brain, we see some of our really primary emotions wired. So things like Anger and sexual desire are wired right in there, so they're pretty low in that limbic brain because they're very important for survival, right? I have to be angry enough to fight for my woman or I have to you know, be sexually proficient enough to go on and procreate so that the species keeps going. So these things are wired pretty low. And, and then we get more and more level of emotion as we go. But keep that in mind. Sex and aggression are really close to the core. Okay? Then we get up a little higher. Then we get to the highest level. And remember, the further we get out, the more problems we're likely to have. So what kinds of functions exist on these outer layer, this furthest out layer? Well, that's what we call sort of our neocortex. Neo meaning new, sort of our new brain. So it's our most evolved brain, I suppose, is the way it's thought about. And that's the part of brain that's responsible for complex thought. That's the part of our brain that does problem solving. That's the part of our brain that says, if I do this, then this might happen. If I were going to go here, then that might result in this. That's what your neocortex is doing. Sometimes I like to think about it as, you know, you get to your limbic brain and into your brain stem, those lower regions, there's your gas pedal regions. Those are the parts that are the accelerator. The neocortex, the higher areas, those problem-solving areas, that's your brake pedal. So, thinking about the brain, here's our structure again. These areas are a little bit more intact. These areas are working better with alcohol exposure the further out we get, the more damage we get. So the gas pedal is often working really well. Gas pedal is great. I mean, if I were like a Toyota person, I'd say the gas pedal was even sticky. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't say those jokes right now. But anyway, but the gas pedal works well. It's the brake 
that isn't always there. It's the brake that isn't always doing what it's supposed to do when we talk about this pattern. And so when you think about the brain that way and you think, okay, so the gas pedal is working really well, particularly when it relates to anything to do with sex and aggression, and the brake does not work particularly well in terms of the actual ability of the brain to regulate these. So as you think about those, think about perhaps some of the individuals that you've seen in your office, and some of this may fit, or you might go, oh, okay, I can see that, or that does fit, or that makes sense. On to the thing here. So knowing that, now we have a bit of a sense of the structure of the brain. Now we've kind of talked about how the brain works, and, and, how, and I'm not going to go on and on about the brain anymore today. I'll spare you all a lot more brain talk today. But I really wanted us to think about that structure because it's very relevant to the kinds of problems you guys are seeing and the challenges that your clients might be experiencing. Because these higher level areas of damage in particular are the ones that translate into that day-to-day -day function, what you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. If somebody has difficulty applying the brakes, you're going to know it. We're all going to know it. Um, another key piece of this is that you guys can't look into the brains. I, at least I can. I can't look at the brain and tell you that the reptilian brain looks great, limbic not so great, and neocortex there's a lot of problems. No. And we, knowing that the face isn't necessarily an indicator, growth isn't an indicator, guess what? We now know we're dealing with an invisible disability. So somebody who's walking in your office, unless you've got something in your paperwork, you don't know what you're dealing with. You have no idea. There's nothing that's going to walk in there and you're not going to say, oh, yeah, okay, this is, this is clear, this is obvious to me. That's another challenge. So this person isn't able to function well day to day, and it's not apparent to everybody who's working with them. So instead, we tend to look at a lot of behavior and a lot of these the difficulties that our clients may have as being really willful and intentional. And in some cases, they are. I'm not saying none of them are. But in some cases, they may be a case of just that brake pedal isn't practice, that brake pedal isn't working for them in that moment, in that day. So it may not always be willful behavior, yet we see it as that. And when we see it as willful, we treat it as willful. And over time, pretty soon, our clients start to think, well, I guess it is. I guess I am. Must be. That's what everyone else says. And we get into that cycle. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about some of the specific kinds of functional problems that you might see. So we've talked about the brain, and I've said, yes, it sees higher level areas. So let's boil that down even a bit further and look at it less from a brain lens. So we've kind of had that brain perspective and talked about what it means or what that damage pattern is like in the brain. Um, now let's talk about some of the functional things. What does this mean day to day for these individuals? What does this translate to? Well, we see a lot of memory problems. This is a population who really struggles with a lot of memory problems. This may mean in your work you may get a lot of stories that don't make sense sort of run in circles, and they feel a lot like lies. And sometimes they are lies. Understand that while I say there's, this is, there's sometimes we're talking about lies, but sometimes we're really not. Sometimes we're just talking about stories that they don't even know what's true and what's lying anymore because of that brain organization. You may get some really vague details, not because they don't want to tell you, but because they really don't know. And the more we press for details, the more they're just going to uh, generate something that they come up with, which may not be true. Um, you'll get a lot of detail about irrelevant information. Okay, I can't remember that, but I can remember this, or I think I can remember something, so I'm going to tell you all about that. Meanwhile, you're sitting in your desk going, oh, make it stop. But they're going on and on, and you're like, no, no, I actually want to know about this. But they don't know about that. They can't remember about that, so they're going to give you what they have. Um, you'll get situationally specific learning. You'll get people who say, well, this is what I should do in this situation. And you'll say, okay, well, yeah, but then why didn't you do it in that situation? Nothing, did air. The idea that what I've learned here, what I can do here, is the same as what I can do there, doesn't transfer. That memory doesn't always transfer. And so when you're saying, but, but if you were going to your training program and you did just fine, then why when you went home did it all fall apart? Uh, you use this strategy great at home, why couldn't you use it at home? And it's easy for us to say, well, clearly you didn't want to, or clearly at home you didn't care as much. Or, and some of those things may be true, but you know what? They might not be. And we could be dealing with that inability to transfer that information between those two settings. 
When I talk about memory, I often talk, particularly when it relates to individuals affected by FASD, I often talk about sort of filing cabinets. I use the filing cabinet analogy of memory, where we all get information and we file in our cabinet. So you guys are all here today and maybe you've got a drawer for your clients and you go in your client drawer and there's some information and, oh, there's my FASD file folder. I open up my FASD and I put whatever I'm learning today in that FASD file folder in my client drawer, in my cabinet of whatever. We organize memory in that way. A lot of times individuals with FASD don't have that structure of organization. So what happens is they go to their filing cabinet and they kind of eeny, meeny, miny, more, oh, this drawer, and they toss it in and they say, oh, here's something for stuff I learned. And they throw it in the stuff I learned drawer, maybe, maybe that drawer. Could be a totally different thing, but maybe. So then you come to them and you ask them a question. You say, hey, you were at that learning thing the other day on FASD. What did you learn? Ooh, okay, stuff I learned. Pull open the stuff I learned drawer. Pull out a couple of sheets of paper. Well, I learned that 3 plus 3 is 6, and then I learned that the cat jumps over the moon, and I also learned, and you're going, that wasn't at the FASD session. What are you talking about? They go, oh, absolutely, it is. I remember it. It was there. It was there. I am not making this up. And you're going, no, really, I was at that session. That was not talked about. Well, now it was actually, but anyway. Um, they truly believe, and they'll be quite adamant sometimes, and they'll be insulted that you don't believe them. And sometimes the stories are not so obviously wrong as the one I'm using right now. So where were you when this happened? Or where were you when you were supposed to be doing this? You're going to get a story, and they're going to say, no, this is really, I swear this is the truth. And you're like, no, it's not the truth. I know it's not the truth. Because the police officer picked you up over here. So you weren't there. You were here. It's, it's, it's clear. It's, it's obvious. No, oh, I don't remember it like that. And sometimes they'll stick to stories like you wouldn't believe. And it can be incredibly frustrating. But a lot of the time with this, this population, that's really legitimate. So the fact that their memory or the fact that part of it's true and part of it's not, or the fact that they're really confused in their stories and they're kind of going in circles... That can be really genuine memory problems because of brain injury. Watching for those kind of patterns, even if you're not sure, is this individual I'm working with? Because a lot of times you're probably not going to know. You're probably not going to have a diagnosis of FASD to kind of give you this, oh, hey, I'm dealing with FASD. But if you're working with a client and you're going, well, these are really blatant efforts to lie. Like, they're not even trying. They're not that good at this even. And they're going in stories, and I'm giving them evidence that's, that's clear, and I'm saying, no, look, you're wrong and they're still sticking to their story, if you run into those kind of things, those are good flags. Those are good warning signs saying, okay, I know this person isn't diagnosed, but there's something not quite right here. Like, they're sticking to this too much. They're being a little bit too persistent. You know what? I remember what Jackie's saying. Maybe this isn't just willful denial. Maybe what I'm dealing with here is actual memory problems and memory impairment. Maybe I have to step back a bit and reevaluate this. And so pressing for details in those situations isn't helpful. Because if they don't remember, if they don't have a good, solid memory of it, the details that they generate will probably be false, too. They're just going to keep sifting in that filing cabinet and pulling things out. And so more information does not necessarily mean more accurate information. If anything, you might just work them into a deeper hole because they're going to tell more lies and get themselves into more trouble. It's better to sort of backtrack that a little bit and think, okay, where else can we get this information? How else can we think about this question? Other kinds of things. So that's the memory picture. So that's a little bit into memory. Um, judgment and reasoning problems. Again, we're up in that higher level, that higher thinking level. We can see a lot of judgment and reasoning problems. And that's part of why they're in front of you in the first place. These individuals are often very rigid thinkers, meaning if they're in a situation and they're being asked a question, they don't see four options. Hey, buddy, let's go hang out at the bar. And they're like, okay, my order says I'm not supposed to go to the bar and drink. But this person says this, what are my options? Go with my friend. That's all they see. That's the only choice they see. Others of us would say, well, you can go with your friend, or you can say no, or you can stay home, or you can make up an excuse to cover your back. Oh, I really like to, man, but that mm, PO is not letting me do this, and they're going to come check up on me. You know, they could make up stories. They could do whatever to keep themselves from getting in that situation. But those options don't come to them. Those options don't become available to them. Even when you've been over them sometimes, because remember, we, memory isn't so great. So even if you've said, here's some options, sometimes it's very hard for them to find it. So it's one-track thinking. It's fairly rigid. 
Johnny said, let's go to the bar. Okay, I'm going to go to the bar. And off I go. And I'm in there, and I'm in the bar, and I've been there half an hour, and all of a sudden I go, wait a minute. I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Oh, well, too late now, and I don't know how to get out of it. And I don't know how to backtrack. And so there's that rigid thinking, and some of that is a brain-based type of, of difficulty. This is a population that can be very naive in social interactions. They really can be naive, and, which doesn't fit well with rigid thinking. You don't see a lot of options, and you're so easily manipulated. A lot of times, these individuals, um, they just want to be liked. They want to have friends. They want to belong. They're not all that unique in that respect. We all kind of want those things. Um, and so they can be really naive, and they're not thinking to themselves, wow, the fact that we drove away in this car really, really fast, and then they gave me the keys, and they all ran away and said, here, just hang out here for a few minutes, we'll be back, isn't true. And those police sirens are not a good sign, and maybe I should run? No, not coming to me. I'm just sitting there going, yep, yeah, my friends will be back. Yep, yeah, my friends will be back. And I'm walking away in my cuffs. Yep, yeah, my friends will be back. No, they're not. So there is a level of naivety in these social interactions that leave this population really vulnerable to abuse, really vulnerable for being taken advantage of. And when they're out on probation or when they're in these situations, again, they're very vulnerable to the influence of people. And knowing who their people are and who their people are supporting them becomes the questions that are important to us as we say, what's going to be healthy for you and how do we set you up for support? Because you're not always going to make the best choices on your own. How can I support that decision-making? How can I be useful in that? Not learning from mistakes. Just because I've done it 20 times, just because every time I put my finger in the mouse trap, it snaps on me, maybe the next time it won't. <laughs> You'd think that we learn from those kind of things. This is a group that doesn't. It keeps snapping on their finger, and they're kind of going, oh, how did that happen? Right? And they're almost surprised. Whoa, I didn't think that was going to happen again. Not always, but this is another thing that sometimes you can see with this, this group. And so this can be really frustrating for anybody working with the population because you're going, okay, ten times. Same thing, ten times. Like, you know, at least come up with a new way of doing it. Don't, don't keep, you know, and it can be, you're almost shaking your head. Another kind of flag, right, if you're working with a client and they keep getting in trouble and they keep doing it in exactly the same way. There seems to be no effort to shake things up a little bit. And you're going at least try to do things a little different. Like, you know, that's what we're dealing with, okay? And we've got that rigidity still. So we're kind of rigid. We're not all that flexible. We're not learning from mistakes. So I've got one way, and I'm going to keep doing that one way. And just because it hasn't worked for me in the past, I don't have another way. So I'm just going to keep doing it, okay? Often this is a population who misses the big picture. They don't always, because that organization, their ability to organize the world isn't good, they can't always see how one thing leads to another. If I do this... This might happen, and this might happen, and this might happen. Those long-term, those consequences, sometimes even the immediate consequences, aren't always apparent. Intelligence could be anything. This is another one of those red herrings. Kind of like face and growth, which are not useful pieces of information to you. Intelligence is not necessarily a useful piece of information. I mean, it could be. If, if they've got a very low intelligence, that could be useful information for you. In a lot of ways, it's useful if there is a low intelligence because all of a sudden there's a lot more resources and options available to you to support this individual. So it's, it's a bit of a, a, a blessing, really, when we're dealing with low intelligence because it does open the door to a lot more support opportunities. But generally speaking, intelligence is not reflective. An individual who presents with an average intelligence, they seem like they should be fine, can still present with all of these same brain difficulties that I'm talking about. Just because they can go in and get a test done and they can perform in the average range does not mean that they can make it in life. Just because you can pass a test doesn't mean you can pass life. And this group really can't translate it. It's way easier to do things in a test situation than it is to take it the next step and translate that to life. And that's where we get higher level in that brain. The higher we get into the neocortex, the more we're talking about day-to-day -day, as opposed to test-taking abilities. So don't be misled by ideas of intelligence. Oh, this person's got a high IQ. I've seen individuals affected by FASD with well above average IQs. And you look at them on paper, and you're like, whew, this person's smart. Clearly, they're just manipulating the system. But there's actually been a pervasive pattern of brain injury in some of the higher functions around rigidity, judgment, problem solving, and even memory. Even memory. 
memory in an IQ test is not that difficult. There's not that much demand. Memory in life, it's huge. It's huge. So um, I guess what I want to say is let's not be misled by the intelligence. So look, that, look at that one as useful if that <laughs> helps you provide services, but don't set your expectations according to those numbers. Another thing. Um, oh, yes, I want to talk about level of function. And this is sort of that functional piece. Like I said, the IQ gives you a number, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about function. What you might see is you might see an individual who presents as even slightly more childlike than you would suggest. Or even sometimes you may see, and, and I, I keep saying may and sometimes, because remember, no two individuals are the same. So you might see some things in one and some things in another. It might vary. But sometimes you see an individual's childlike. So you may read and you say, okay, this is my client that's coming in. You're reading their background. You're going, oh, okay, where's my little buzzer? I want to make sure I'm safe. This guy sounds like a little bit of work. And they walk in, and they're fairly bounding into your office. Doo -doo -doo. Hey, how are you doing? And you're like, wow. <laughs> you're like five you know, years old here, and they're kind of... And, and you, you may find that sometimes you're kind of surprised. You're like, wow, this wasn't... I read what you've done, and I'm meeting you, and I... This was not what I had in mind. I'm a little surprised. You may encounter that sometimes. It's another good little flag, another little flag for you, especially, again, if you're dealing with people where you don't know the background, you don't know if there's been a diagnosis, you don't have this information. If you're kind of wondering, how do I know, Jackie, if it's brain and not just somebody who's trying to mani manipulate, these are some of the flags that are helpful. When you see that their presentation and interaction with you seems more childlike than you would expect, given the history and background you've heard. And, and I don't have any nice, hard and fast to give you what that means, but I think when you've seen it and when you've experienced, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, again, as I talked about them being naive, often very vulnerable, often the scapegoats. These are the guys who are often left, or gals, often left holding the bag. They're holding the bag. There's usually a bunch of people they've been involved in activities and criminal activity with, and they're the one who gets caught. And, of course, they're a horrible witness, too, because their memory isn't so hot. So they get caught, and they're really not good at telling police or anybody else who did it with them. So sometimes they look like they're protecting people, protecting friends, or are you trying to mislead? Are you trying not to let us know who did it? They actually are sometimes really having a hard time identifying who did what with them. Or if they know the information they give, they say, well, this person did it, and this is how I know, and here's the, the evidence, but it's all still pieced together. It's, it's not sufficient for that individual to be um, also charged. So we see that kind of scapegoat pattern with this population. Um, often they just don't get it. Oftentimes you'll be like, wow, you're not, things aren't put together, or they may not really fully appreciate the seriousness of what's going on for them or what's happening in their life. Not that they don't care. This is not a don't care. And I really want to distinguish between don't care and don't get it, because don't get it can look like don't care, and they're not the same thing. Sometimes don't get it is I really just don't get it. Don't get it is, is sort of, you know, a five-year-old who doesn't understand that putting, you know, well, I suppose by five you should know not to put your hand on the hot burner, but let's say you don't, and has to try that. It's that don't get it. It's not that I don't care about burning myself. It's that I don't get that that's actually going to burn me or that's going to affect me in the way that I should or that you would expect an adult to. And secondary disabilities. I've put up secondary disabilities there, and that's really a broad term. We could talk all day about that, but I'm not going to. But when we say secondary disabilities, we are talking about the additional things that are experienced by individuals affected by FASD. So primary disability is the disability or is the damage that occurs to the developing brain. So the primary injury to the developing brain. Secondary disabilities are the other vulnerabilities that come along in that individual's life secondary to that injury to their brain. So this is a population that not only has brain injury, but they're also more likely to experience instability or, or dysfunctional home environments, um, more likely to be using drugs and alcohol, more likely to be associating with negative influences, all of these things, more likely to be struggling in school, more likely to be frustrated in school, therefore, okay, I'm frustrated in school, no brake pedal, lots of accelerator. So when I'm frustrated, do I say, no, I shouldn't swear at my teacher? No, because I don't have a brake pedal. I only have an accelerator. So I'm frustrated and I swear. <laughs> so then I'm expelled or at least suspended. Those are the kind of secondary disabilities we see. So primary disability, 
is I don't have the brake pedal to say maybe I shouldn't cuss my teacher out right now. Secondary disability is that suspension that comes because I did cuss my teacher out. And so when we talk about secondary disabilities, we're sort of saying this is a group that not only is dealing with brain injuries, but often has had a lot of things happen in their life that has really aggravated those kinds of problems and really um, exacerbated those vulnerabilities. All right, so let's start talking about what we can do. And if I've talked a lot, and I'll keep kind of talking about things you might see, but I want to start talking a little bit about strategies and what things this might mean um, for you guys. And again, keep thinking of questions or things that you might have for me along these lines, because I definitely am I'm trying to really watch my time so that we have lots of time at the end for questions around these. So what can you do? I always like to start with one of the best things we can do is be advocates for individuals, appreciating that this is a population who do not typically advocate well for themselves. We need somebody to recognize that this is a population who has a brain injury and requires additional support, who requires a slightly different perspective. We have to think about this individual differently. We have to problem solve, we have to troubleshoot, maybe a little differently with a little bit different understanding of what's going on for them. If you can advocate for your client in that regard, if you can let other people who are involved in working with your client know these things, sometimes we can be proactive and, and prevent problems. Watching for flags. I've been kind of talking about flags as we've been talking because... Um, Oftentimes, you're going to find these people come into your office and there isn't a diagnosis. I mean, we know right now that there are a lot of people, particularly if it is adults that you work with exclusively, that there are a lot of adults who may be affected by FASD and do not have the diagnosis. So your job is sort of to say, well, there are some flags, there are some indications here. Am I diagnosing FASD because I see flags? No, no. I'm not suggesting that you say, oh, I saw some flags, I think they have FASD. No, but rather say, maybe... I'm seeing some flags. I'm seeing some things in the way this person's memory is functioning. Maybe I need to interact with them a little bit differently. Let me try a different strategy. Hey, wait, this is one of those flags Jackie talked about. Maybe this isn't defiance. Maybe this is something else. Let me try something. Let me try doing it different and see if that works. So regardless of whether or not you know or even suspect that your client may or may not have FASD, these strategies and these kind of rules of thumb can be useful for any population where you're seeing some of these patterns of dysfunction and, and you suspect that, okay, this might be just something, a time to apply some of our different thinking. All right. So recognizing difficulties is really an important first step. First step is to say, wait a minute, there's something different in what's going on here. Because once we kind of recognize that there might be something different, then we're in a position where we might be able to respond differently. Um, when we recognize that this individual is presenting with some of these problems, we may say they'll function best within a well-controlled setting. This is an individual who may have problems in that higher neocortex brake pedal part of their brain. If that's the case, what can we do in their environment to increase sort of the natural controls to help remove the hills? If we know the brake pedal isn't so good, how many flat roads can we put into their life as opposed to really hilly roads? What can we do to increase the structure of their life and reduce the need for the brake pedal? If we can reduce the need for the brake pedal a little bit, then we reduce the number of times that they're going to go out of control. Um, that way, we've got a predictable environment, a predictable environment where this person can operate um, with greater success and accountability. Um, knowing that this is a population that requires ongoing support through adulthood. So this is not, because we're talking about brain injury, this is not something that gets better with time. This is not something that's going to go away. This is an individual that once you find the right fit, once you find the right support, or anybody who's working with them, or anybody that you might be talking to who's working with this individual, once you find a good fit, don't take it away. Don't change it. Don't remove that support. This is something that through their life might be necessary to help promote their success. Uh, connecting them with social supports that provide coaching redirection. Again, this is thinking about that advocacy role. The more you can connect these individuals with supports that are available to them in the community and inform the supports that they're working with about the kinds of needs they have, 
the better we are, the better we're able to provide that controlled, supportive environment. And recognizing that this individual may not have the skills necessary. Even just saying, this might not be, I don't want to. This might be somebody who simply doesn't have the skills to do this. So how do we support them in those skills? Because not having the skills to live successfully and independently is one thing. Doesn't mean that they don't have the skills or the abilities to have some successes and to go on and have a better life and a good life. That's there. That is a possibility. We just need to help with the right supports in place that help them towards that goal. So this isn't to say that there's no hope and there's no possibility and just, you know, forget it. This is more saying what can we do to help find those successes and find those successful opportunities because that's really important. And remembering, too, when we talked about secondary disabilities, this is a group that probably have spent most of their lives hearing about what they can't do well and what they can't do right and how they're failing. And they've also probably spent a lot of their life going, I don't get it. I keep failing, and I'm not sure why, and I don't know how to make it better. And people are saying, oh, you know how to make it better. If only you would try. And they're going, no, I, I really don't know how to make it better. And I know I'm failing, and it feels pretty crappy to fail, but I don't know how not to fail. I don't know how to change it. Remember, I'm only one track. It's the only track I know. And yet everybody kind of reads that as... You don't want. You don't want to switch. You don't want to be flexible. You're happy where you are. It's like, no, I'm not. I just don't have any other options. So when we reframe a little bit and say, well, no, maybe this is a group who really wants to have success as much as anyone else does who really wants to, what can we do to help find that and start framing things in a where can we go, not where have you been? Who can you be, not who are you? And, and helping them to find some different tracks, helping them get on another track. Let's use that rigidity to our advantage. If we can get them on a good track and get them stuck on the right one, that could work to our advantage too. That could be something that could work to their advantage is if we can get them sort of stuck into the kind of thing. If we can get them to a training and a work routine and stuff where they're not encountering populations that are going to pull them off, where we can sort of get them as controlled and structured and supported as possible, getting up, going to work, do the thing, do 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 That's a nice kind of pattern and predictability and structure in life that could really work for this population, if we can get there. So, some of the other things that um, we can do to the woods. Being an information hub, which is easier said than done, I, I realize that. But this is a group that because of multiple needs, and we talked about the secondary disabilities, we're talking about multiple needs, very high needs, across a lot of different professions and disciplines. This is a group who usually are working with a lot more than the justice system. They may have children's services involved in their life. They may have some kind of educational services. They may, there may be tons of different systems that are involved in this person's life. How are they going to coordinate that? They're not. They're not. They're going to kind of bounce kind of like a pinball in a machine, you know, from one system to the next system to the next system. The information they communicate between systems isn't always going to be accurate. It isn't going to be good. What they need is one person and one of those systems to stop and say, okay, I need to make sure we're all at the same table. Like, I need to know that we're all talking the same thing. And this individual isn't able to advocate for that themselves. So what can I do? Can I be a hub? Can I spend a certain degree of my time, instead of asking them to tell me lots of stories or tell me what you've, they've done, knowing that they're going to get confused with that, instead spend the time I would have been doing that with them on the phone. They can be sitting right in front of me. Let's make some phone calls together. And we phone this person. Hi, I've got so-and-so in my office. This is what we're doing. Da -da -da. Here's their appointment plan for this week. This is what I'm giving them. Okay, done. Pick up the phone. Next person. And spend that time sort of functionally setting up their structure for that next week. I'm not going to worry about you telling me everything you've done this week. Tell me if you've got a story. I'm not saying we can't interact. But I'm going to use our time a little bit differently to coordinate your next steps for the next few days as best I can. Sort of thinking, how can I best use my time? Because you guys, huge caseloads, never enough time to do even half of what you want to do. So is there a way to shift the time you do have to ways that might support this individual better, knowing that adding more to your workload isn't going to help? So can we shift it? I don't know. But those are some, some thoughts. Um, when you do engage in conversation and talking, allowing a little bit... Um, more time for responding, so we don't want to pressure, because if they have to work fast or think fast, they're going to just throw information at you, and it's often not going to be right. 
So any kind of pressure usually doesn't produce more or accurate information. Um, when speaking, we want to use short directives. This is an individual that often struggles with language. This is a group who, um, and I didn't talk a lot about communication today, but this is a group who often will speak and sound better than they receive information. So they may come in and they may throw out a few sentences to you and you're like, whoa, wow, that sounds really great. You've done cognitive behavioral therapy to address your early traumatic experiences in life and feel as though you've processed these events sufficiently. Wow, if you can say that, you can understand anything. Well, just because they can say it doesn't mean they can understand it. If you stop and say, what does cognitive behavioral therapy mean? Or, or what does trauma mean? When you say trauma, well, trauma, it's that thing that happened to me when I was young. Okay. Well, can you give me an example of the thing that happened? Well, it was trauma. Okay. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, the thing that happened to me when I was young. And you're like, oh, okay. Do we know what we're talking? Are we all? And sometimes you'll find that. And so kind of checking and, and keeping and, and thinking, does this individual really understand even what they're saying? Or are they just saying things that they've heard or people have said to them that they've kind of picked up and they've got a few catchphrases that they're using well? Or do they really understand it? So sometimes they will sound better and they won't be understanding. So when we're talking, when we're giving directives, we want to keep them short and we want to constantly be checking for comprehension. Just because they say, I understand, doesn't mean they do understand. They've spent a lot of years in school being told they're dumb. They don't want to feel dumb anymore. So they're going to, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, even if they don't, no, no. They're tired of being dumb. So they're just going to say, yeah, I get it. Oh, I totally understand. Um, be very concrete and specific when giving instructions. Again, same idea, really keeping it concrete, keeping it tied to things they know, places they know. Um, if there is a trade or a profession that they work in, Using that as a concrete way to make some examples, so you know the way you do this, use that as sort of a way to illustrate um, what they need to do. Don't overschedule days. This is a group that may take more time to get places, to think about things, to organize themselves. So we think we want to keep them structured, and we want days to be sort of set, but we also don't need to have an appointment at 9 and 10 and somewhere they've got to be at 11 and then they got because they're going to start off their day and they're just it's going to be too much and they're just going to throw the towel in for the whole day. So we want structure, but we won't, don't want really tight structure where there's lots and lots that have to be done. Um, when a response is given, um, again, we talked about memory and fabrication of stories. Um, they're eager to please, their memory isn't very good, so they can be making up things or just, like I say, generating, pulling memories out of that filing cabinet as best they can. They might be trying to please you. So even though they're not giving you what you want, you're like, no, 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 I don't want to lie, I want the truth, but they're going to say whatever they think is going to make you happy sometimes. Um, whenever there are forms to be filled out, Things that they have to do, if they're going through other organizations and processes they need to go through, either helping them or trying to help them find somebody who can support them in completing these forms. When there's forms or any processes they need to go through, this is something they're going to really struggle with. And they'll get quickly overwhelmed and they'd rather walk away than worry about doing this. Um, less reliance on verbal exchanges, as we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, advocating for visual learning. It's a population that will see or learn better by doing and engaging a little bit. So if you're able to be a hub or if you're able to connect people together, say, um, keep in mind that this is somebody who learns better by visually. Don't, you know, don't talk their ear off. Or, hey, you know, you're their counselor. That's great. I'm really glad that so-and-so is able to get counseling support. Um, just make sure, you know, you keep... I've noticed this and this and this about them. Can we watch out and not challenge them verbally too much? Or can you look at some other approaches in your practice that aren't as verbal-based? Those kinds of things. Nothing that says that you guys can't speak up to some degree and advocate around what some of those needs might be. Even if it is just opening a conversation with those other professionals to say, I've noticed these things. I'm concerned about Johnny's ability to... I think we need to come up with approaches that are not verbal, that are not as language-based. What do you think? Do you have ideas? Bringing people on board, getting people, sort of just alerting people. That's a great way to advocate. Um, some of the questions that you want to ask yourself, things you want to ask when this person is sitting in front of you, you're meeting them and you're working with them. Does this individual have the ability to comply? 
what might be barriers to their ability to comply? How can I support, provide structure, or advocate in such a way that might help them? Can we rephrase instructions? Can we look at the instructions and the things we're saying to them that will make more sense? Can I break tasks down into smaller steps? Is there a way to break this out even into smaller steps so that I'm sure that they know what needs to happen to get through this task or this job that they need to do? What, uh, will what I'm requesting result in success? I think continuing to think about success promotion and not just problem prevention is a little bit of a shift in, in, in our framework as well. So not only are we wanting to try to anticipate and prevent problems, we want to identify and promote opportunities for success and say, is this, if I suggest this, is there, an op is there an option? Do I really think they stand a chance of being successful in this? And what could I add that would increase the likelihood that they can have success, success doing this? Uh, some of the conditions, some of the things to do when you're looking at a probation order. Reviewing conditions each appointment, all the time. Don't assume they know them. And they'll say, oh, we did this last time. This is so boring. That's okay. We're going to do it again. This is the way I work. This is what I do. I want to make sure we're still on the same page. I want to make sure we still know what's doing. Make it part of the routine, part of the process, part of setting that, that road. Um, where possible, and this is that uh, external network, if there's a caregiver or if there is a partner or if there is an individual in that person's life who can participate in that process, where it's possible, there may be times to invite them in or invite them to be a part of that process or look at where you can engage other systems of support with this individual. Saying, well, you know what, it would help if somebody else knew that this is important. It would help if they have other people in their life that can say, hang on a minute, I'll be your brake pedal today. And creating those networks to help them keep their conditions. The more they have people around them, so just as influences can be negative, influences can be positive. Just as being naive can get you into trouble, it can also get you in a situation where you have the right influences in your life who can support you towards some success and help set more opportunities for success. Understanding, as we're talking about communication, we want to explain, of course, explain conditions, but really under, ask them whether or not they're understanding. We already talked a little bit about the, yes, they'll nod, they'll say they understand, but do they really? Ask questions like, what does this mean to you? What will this look like in your life? Tell me how you're going to do this um, are really important kinds of things. Using concrete examples as much as you possibly can. Give a visual of expectations. Um, make it as applied and practical as you can. Um, repeat as much as you need to. Repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat each visit and find, you know, make it so that it's as routine and structured part of their life as you can. So some, some conditions, some things that you may want to spend some time with. Things like no contact. When you're dealing with somebody who has a no contact order or something that says they can't be in contact with somebody else, really working with them that no contact means no contact. It doesn't just mean no contact in their home or no contact on the street, or no contact when you're here, but you can have contact here. No, it means none. It means zero. So when you're here, can you have contact? No. When you're here, can you have contact? No. It, it sometimes makes me think of what we do with young kids when we do stranger danger and stuff like this. And what we do is we say, let's say a little grandma comes into the playground and says, come away with me and, and help me find my dog. Do you go with them? And the kids yell, no, you don't go with them. And you give them all these scenarios and say, do you go with them? No, you don't go with them. In this scenario, do you go with that person? No, you don't go with them. Same kind of ideas. It's the same kind of brain training that we're doing around this. If you run into so-and-so on the street, do you go and talk to them? No, I don't talk to them. If you run into so-and-so on your doorstep because they come over, do you let them in? No, I don't talk to them. If I am walking it through. I mean, in a way that works for them. But the idea of that repetition and the idea of taking it into different situations and different examples as applied as you can. Otherwise, anything can be an exception. Well, didn't say this, so this must be okay. Um, and again, each appointment, remind them. Remind them, remember this is no contact and we're referring to this person. And remember what that means. You need to review these. Uh, keep the peace, good behavior. Ask them. 
what does this mean to you? What would this look like? How are you going to do this? Help them to ground that. Be very specific about expectations. These are really abstract kind of concepts. Be on good behavior. What does it mean to be on good behavior? According to who and under what circumstances? And really, what are you talking about? That's incredibly abstract. We need to bring that down to a much more concrete, practical level. Being on good behavior means don't do this, do this. Not just don'ts. In fact, as much as possible, when we can work more with do's and less with don'ts, we're better off. If I say to you, don't think about the purple elephant, what are you all thinking about right now? Probably a purple elephant, but don't. If I say, do think about something, do this, we provide options and we provide direction. Otherwise, a lot of don'ts leave somebody going, okay, I know what I can't do, but what can I do? Well, where does that leave me? So focusing as much on what does good behavior mean? It means you can do this, and it means you can do that, and you can do this. Don't do these things, but do this, and do this, and do this as much as possible, and keeping it really practical, because like I said, that's incredibly abstract. Um, a peer is required, talking about going to court, any appointments, what does that mean? What does it mean to go to court? Um, that mean they've been to court? You say, yeah, you've been to court, you've done this before, you should know what you're talking about. No, don't assume that. Talk them through each of these things, through appointments. Um, help to make sure, check what their appointments are. How are you keeping track of your appointments? Where are they kept? How do you know you're not losing them? Where are they? Um, enlist again families where you can. As best as you can, keeping appointments or encouraging your client to keep appointments that they have as well consistent. So if you can always meet the same time, it's the same day every week, and as much as their schedule can be identical from week to week, is better. The less shift, because if things are flexing and if things are shifting, then they're going to forget, and they're going to show up t on Tuesday to what's on Thursday, and they're going to show up on Wednesday to their Monday appointment, and they'll be confused. So the more that weeks can be identical, they're in your office every Monday morning at 10 a.m., and they know that Monday mornings at 10 a.m., they're always in this place. Great. That's better. If it has to switch a lot, that will be harder for them to make. All right. Things like curfew as well. Keeping it really simple. Sometimes what we say is, you know, during the week, it's a weekday, so you have an earlier curfew or a later curfew on the weekend, or we make some of these adjustments. Ah, oh, that's just confusing. Is it 11 tonight, or is it midnight, or is it what? When am I? Curfew, the same time, every day, no matter the day of the week. As much as possible, we want routine and structure. We're working with somebody who does well when they're in one track. They're a rigid thinker. The more we ask them to shift and flex, the more we're creating opportunities for them to run into trouble. They're going to be out after curfew, and then they're going to be in trouble, and they're going, but I thought my curfew was midnight. Well, no, not on a Monday night. It's only that on a Sunday night. Or, you know, they're going to get that confused. Um, finding ways or helping them find ways to keep appointments on them, keep that information on them, is really helpful. So if they can have little cards that they write up, that they carry around, that remind them, of, particularly if things are regularly scheduled, if they have certain appointments or work training things or work-related uh, things that they need to be at, having those recorded so they can kind of pull it out and look at it, is really helpful. Um, and having a few of them made up, encouraging them, because they're going to lose them. So encouraging them, this one goes in your pocket, and this one goes in your wallet, and this one goes in your fridge, and this one goes by your phone, and every appointment, have you lost them? Do you need a few more this week? Here's your appointment slips, and here's a whole bunch of them, and this one goes in your wallet, remember, and this one goes here, so that they have these things accessible, so that they can reference them, look at them, and go, oh, okay, I see what we're doing. Um, I... I I can keep track of this. It's part of that external brain. A lot of what I'm talking about is creating sort of what we refer to sometimes as an external brain or supports that we can provide from the individuals, the professionals, the family members that are around this individual that can help promote success in their functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Whew, I'm good. I'm almost done here. And then we'll get to questions. So... This is sort of just a, a paradigm shift, and this is not my quote. This is um, uh, Dan Dubofsky, who I really enjoy listening to. And, yeah, some people nodding here. He's just a lovely speaker. Uh, but this is what he says, and, and I, I think it really captures it. 
He says we must move from viewing the individual as failing if he or she does not do well in a system to viewing the system as not providing what the individual needs in order to succeed. I think the more that we can look at what we're doing as a system, as individuals in a system, working with other people in systems to say, what could we be doing differently? Yes, there are barriers. Yes, there are things that make this really hard. How can we think outside the box? How can we build relationships? How can we break down barriers between systems and start talking together, working together in a way that supports our clients towards success? What can we do differently to support them? And, and I think that's really how I've come at this and, and sort of my encouragement around this. Now, I really was wanting to leave a lot of time for questions because I, I figured there might be some, and certainly that way we can tailor it to your interests and, and ideas. Yes, great, thank you. It's around the whole um, story piece, so <laughs> when they're an offender or when they're a victim and they're trying to capture what it is that happened, what are some techniques that can, you know, other than, you know, not applying the pressure and get, trying to get the answers, but other ways that you can possibly get the most clear story that you can. Yeah. So how do you get the most clear story from somebody who may really challenge? I think one thing is to know that you may not get a clear story from this individual. I think, first off, you simply may never. They may not have in their brain the, the clear story themselves. So um, acknowledging that at the outset is important and, and potentially could save both you and them a lot of frustration around that. But in terms of how to get the best that you can, keeping questions less directive around, did you do this? The more you say, did you do this? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. They might respond in ways um, that, again, are trying to please you. And so you may find that stories are like that. Trying to keep things really concrete. So if they mention a place or a thing that they were doing, tell me about that around that. So you're sort of grounding their memory in something. So you say that you were at the 7-Eleven. Tell me about being at that 7-Eleven. Okay, now I'm in the 7-Eleven. That might help ground that memory. If you say, tell me about when you went and, and did this, activity, you know, if you ask them about the behavior, what they were doing, it's a little more abstract. If you say, you were at the 7-Eleven, what, you know, tell me about the 7-Eleven, you might get a little bit more because they might trigger that memory in a visual capacity and then relay it in that visual as opposed to trying to just remember what they were doing and get caught in that abstract. So I think that would be one strategy I would recommend trying is, is sort of getting them to, to twig your into it. Um, some individuals, and, and depending on the age you're working with, I, I have on occasion had individuals who um, like to draw me things and then tell me about their drawing. Another way to try to get at memory through a bit of a back door doesn't always work really well when you're trying to get me to tell you, you know, tell me what happened. Can't always capture that, but sometimes it does ground it in a little bit more concrete, and you can get a little bit of story that ties to that drawing. Again, it depends on the age, and it depends a lot on your client. A lot of them, you're going to hand them a piece of paper, say, draw me, and they're going to look at you and say, do you want me to eat this pencil now? You know, they're not going to be very happy with you. But, um... That's something else I've tried. I've actually kind of been playing around with that as, as ways to play with it. I wish I could tell you that I have, you know, the way to, to tag it. And to be honest, even in terms of what's really going on for memory for these individuals are things that we're still trying to figure out. We really have not got the answers. And, and, and I'd love to say, oh, here's all the research that tells you what's really working in terms of how to work with these individuals in the justice system, and here's all our great results. Yeah, no, we have none of it. There's nothing. There's no good research. Even research into how to provide good interventions is, like, unbelievable. You know, there's maybe 10 good research articles out there in the world. Like, it, it's amazing. And it's not that people aren't trying and doing things. It's that we're only just starting to try to evaluate and say what's actually working. So 10 years from now, five years, maybe even five years from now, I can stand in front of you and say, hey, we know that this really works. 
we know that asking them about the seven eleven is the way to go because we've checked it, we've studied it, we know. Right now, I can tell you these are things that I try, and these are things I try with my clients when I'm working with clients in my office. I'll say, you know, tell me about the 7-Eleven, or draw me about this. And sometimes they kind of laugh and they do it, and they kind of get into it, and, and they're sort of surprised themselves, and, and it changes our interaction a little bit, and we have some fun with it. But I really also think accepting that you simply may not get the information you really want, and that you may have to let that go and not be totally frustrated. You may say, you know, this is what we're going to work with. Come to an agreement with your client. This is what we're going to work with. This is where we are now. Let's go forward from here because the past is a little murky and it's kind of confused. But what we know is where we are right now. And this is where we're at. So what are we going to do going forward towards success? Sometimes that's what is required is to reframe it um, and not try to resolve the past, but to move forward and say, well, what would a good future look like and what would a successful future look like and what kind of supports might help in that. I know, no perfect answer, say. I wish. I mean, the day I have the, an the answer, oh, that'll be, I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. This is definitely a, a complex group. Any other questions? Yeah. Maybe just a little bit more concrete. <laughs> Um, social supports that we're supposed to be referring to. Is there like a list of them? <laughs> oh, I like the way you say these social supports. <laughs> like, are you making this up? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. And I think that to some degree, people are going to have access to some things more than others. I think it's looking at what supports might be or are available to your client. I would love to say I have a list of really great supports, but you may have a client in front of you who also is involved with a social worker for whatever reason. Maybe there's some family issues or there's a social worker or child welfare worker that's involved with the family. Maybe this is somebody else who, uh, you know, and you may have some of this information available to you as to what other systems that they may be um, acting within. Um, are they receiving any work supports? Are they involved in any training programs? Are there things like that? Are there people, if you're in a training program, if you're going through, I don't know, you're trying to do an apprenticeship program or you're, trying to, you're involved in something in your daily activities, is there a person there that I can connect with? Not to get you in trouble, but to help to support you. And I mean, I realize that we're stretching outside of systems, and I think that this is not always an easy thing to do. I know that we're, there's always issues of confidentiality and privacy, and there's a lot of issues that, that come to bear here. I don't, re, I, you know, I certainly recognize that, but I think identifying who key people in their life might be, and then looking at ways in which you might make contact with some of those people to say, can we all get on the same page? I really want to see this person succeed. What can that look like? Is there things that can happen in your setting? Because I'm not everywhere, and I can't be everywhere, and I've got a caseload that's crazy. I've only got this much time to devote to this. I can't be doing it all. But maybe I can phone a few people. Maybe I can connect with a few people. Can I sort of break through that system bubble that keeps us all separate and access? So no, I don't have a nice, lovely list that says, here's some great supports. Um, here's some people to call. Although, I'll tell you one thing I do do, is I always say to people, if you're, if you're working with a client and you go, wow, this client has a need and I have no idea how to go meet them, I'm always like, hey, send me an email. If I have a suggestion, you've got my email on there, and you can totally take me up on this and say, I've got a client who this is their need. Where do I go for that? Where do I go? And I may say, I have absolutely no idea, but that's a great question. Let me look into it and get back to you. And I've learned more about systems because of that than anything else and some of the people who can we can kind of connect with because there are some programs out there there are systems and there are programs and there are people trying to provide supports um, I think we just need to get feel better connected to them um, I, I just have a suggestion oh good I yes that question um, at all of there are a number of FAS networks throughout the province oh, yeah. um, and every region has an FASD network, and you could contact that network. Um, and I think um, you could easily get the information. Well, I, in fact, I could send you some information if you want about uh, who the contact the coordinators would be in, in each of the regions. And if you 
contact that person, then they'll be able to at least start linking you with other service providers. Yeah. So, so that's, that kind of information um, should be readily available, actually, in every single region through the FASD networks. Yeah. And is there a common website, Jean, for that? Or there is, and I, uh, I think it can <coughs> go to the, um, it, to the Alberta Ministry for Children and Youth. You would find a link to the Cross Ministry. I don't it's know the that you registered on. Yeah. Okay. And I, does, does the Cross okay. Ministry website list all of the yeah. FASD networks yeah. and the contacts? Yeah, there's a specific tab at the top that says networks. Yeah. So that would be a really good place. And most of these networks, yeah, they have members from multiple participating agencies involved and, and looking at programming or supports, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Another reason why it's important for you to contact them with questions about supports for the people that you're working with is that if, they're, if they don't know of anybody providing that particular service, it gives them a clue as to what's, what's needed in the community. That's, that's helpful to them as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was great. I'm like, if you can keep answering like that, I'll swap you out. I'm like, that was an awesome suggestion. Yeah, Jean. Um, I was just wondering if you have any notion about the numbers of people in the, the justice system that might be affected by FASD, and and what kind, of, you know, what the proportion might be on the average probation officers caseload and the implications, because you've, you've suggested a number of uh, strategies for working with these folks, uh, one of which is some fairly close supervision, mm -hmm. um, and that has lots of resource implications. Absolutely. So I'm just wondering if there's been any uh, examination of that whole question around workload and, you know, what's required to support these individuals successfully. Yeah. And what it would mean for probation officers. Uh, Case load. Absolutely. You know, and I don't have that answer either. There have been very little studies done on prevalence rates in, in the justice system. There was one that was done in Manitoba, which didn't even address probation officers. It was merely looking at um, individuals incarcerated. So it was not saying, what does that mean for caseloads? And it came out fairly low. I, I think it was... 2% or, or a fairly low number, but there were some significant limitations to that study, in part including um, the fact that uh, there were a large number of individuals included in the study who were suspected of having FASD, but because there was not a diagnosis and there weren't diagnos diagnostic capabilities, that there may have been significant underreporting. And so that remains one of the biggest barriers, is that to get accurate numbers, we have to have a diagnostic process that tells us because otherwise we can have a lot of suspected and sometimes we suspect right and sometimes we suspect wrong. But having actual clear numbers as to what we're looking with, at, I don't think we're anywhere near that. I know that there are um, efforts to try to get um, better numbers. I know that we'll be seeing in Edmonton soon um, an adult assessment clinic through the Glen Rose Hospital, which is hopefully going to help us to increase our rate of adult assessment. I also know that there are possibly some um, assessment services coming out um, through corrections, through some of the new correction initiatives that are being done um, at uh, the jails. And so they're actually looking at doing some assessment and programming um, in the jails with, with adults. So hopefully that will increase the number of individuals assessed, which will increase our knowledge of how prevalent this is, so that then we can get a sense of numbers and we can start to say, this is just not reasonable. We can't meet these needs with the resources we have, which Gene, I would suspect is the case. Like I feel fairly strongly that there is a large proportion. I, and I know even anecdotally working with a lot of people, it's funny, even in the last couple of months, I've had a lot of people contacting me recently um, about um, individuals they've been working with who are convicted of sexual offenses. 
And a lot of them are saying, wow, you know, I see a lot of these indivi you know, individuals and I suspect that we're dealing with FASD, but I don't know, is there a real higher rate of sexual offending among the individuals affected by FASD? And I said, well, again, it's a great question. We don't know, and I think in part because we have, don't, aren't up to snuff yet diagnostically in terms of having a good idea of numbers. Knowing the way the brain works and the way the gas pedal and the brake work, and the fact that there isn't always a good understanding of cause and effect, I wouldn't be surprised at all. That would fit with our knowledge of this brain injury, that this is a population that may offend sexually more often. So I'm wondering if, if you <coughs> back to, yeah. to that, whether um, you'd be encouraging um, anyone who thinks they're working with someone with FASD to um, refer them for a diagnosis. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, any opportunity, and, and again, I think, Jean, it comes back to what you were saying earlier, too, about if you ask the question, sometimes people recognize that there's a need. If we don't even ask the question or, or look for it, we don't even realize there's a need, and so nobody bothers to look at how to provide it. I think if a lot of people are starting to say, hey, I have these clients, I think that there's, we're looking, you know, assessment would be good, and we see that demand really there, that helps to support efforts to put those services in place. So that's another piece of information that's available on the website, actually, is where those clinics are and yeah. where you can um, yeah. connect. With and each of the networks are connected with these assessment clinics. So the diagnostic clinics, usually somebody from a diagnostic clinic sits on an, each network in, in all regions of Alberta as well. And so that would definitely, and whether or not they actually provide services, not all the clinics, all the diagnostic clinics provide services to adults. Most of them are children only, but there are a few that do provide adult services now. So, and more and more, that we're definitely moving in that direction. Okay. It covers the cost of those um, if they're through um, medical, then they're, they're covered through our medical system. So, for example, at the Glen Rose, they would just be covered through, yeah, through that. So there are no additional d at cost to these assessments. Um, clinics that have been established through the FASD networks are free of charge in the public service. Yeah, yeah, through our health and um, Alberta Health Services, I think, is primarily the, the driver for that. Yeah. Just to add to that, too, for those Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if all have uh, support workers for uh, and me, but you know, some of the communities do have workers available so they take to appointments or help them with, you know, deep building resumes or what the needs are to support or yeah. a really good resource. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the networks really do provide a lot of great access to resources and whether it's, which can really help too. I mean, it could be that your entire advocacy role could be simply connecting with a network and saying, there needs to be an advocate involved here. Is there a worker, is there somebody, or is there a program where I can connect this person who can do the advocacy role? Because I can't, but I can at least start the ball rolling. And, and sometimes there are programs. And I have a question for you regarding resistance <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a client who is, uh, I refer her to the uh, support worker, she won't go, she refuses right. that, that help. She's been diagnosed with FSD. Okay. Um, she rejects her parents who are very knowledgeable, and very, very, uh, they advocate a great deal for her. Yeah. Um, and she refuses to uh, be with them. And in turn, she uh, wants to she lives with a person who uh, takes advantage of her. Oh, right. no. Right. How do you deal with, you know, when we're talking about motivational behavior and things like that, dealing with that resistance and some of the motivational and degree techniques don't necessarily work with that client? No. And in fact, motivational interviewing techniques are often not because they are very language-based. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of um, yeah, sometimes you get tremendous resistance, and there can be a lot of reasons why you're getting resistance, but some of it may just be in the now. I mean, this guy, this individual that she is choosing to be with may be um, detrimental or taking advantage of her in, in any number of ways that may not register for her, though everybody else will be fully aware, and all she knows is what she's getting very good out of that dynamic or what feels good about that. 
everywhere else I go, people expect something of me. Here, it's it's easy. It's and and so her resistance could be to to leaving that. Um, sometimes, again, looking towards um, uh, tangible ideas of who what you what you want to do. Again, getting out of the language and getting into as much visual and talking about. Um, not what we don't want you to do, but what do you want to do, where do you want to go, giving her some, you know, again, that's still getting into some of that a little motivational pieces a little bit, but trying to get her to identify and sort of um, allowing her some of her own direction as much as you can. When we're dealing with somebody who's resistant, the more we push back, as you know, I'm telling you guys stuff, you, you know, the more they're going to push. So if we stop pushing, we say, okay, that's what you want, okay. So now let's go in this direction. What if we do this? Or what if we go in a slightly different way? Or what if we say, okay, we can't, this, this is not going to move right now. So what could move? Is there something there There is possible movement? Is there an area? Is there somewhere in her life, maybe around training or education or work or what is going on? Is there anywhere else in her life where there's less resistance? And so they don't fish around that wall until there's somewhere with less resistance and work there first and leave the, leave the wall for now, you might find as, as more successful. Um, I mean, again, I don't have lovely magical wands, and sometimes you're going to have somebody who's going to just be really resistant, and, and you're going to find that challenging, and you're not going to find success. And, and I think while we talk about external brain, and we talk about supports, and we, we talk about helping people towards success, and, and I even, you know, we put up quotes that put responsibility on the system, at the, at the end of it, I, I don't want to suggest that there's also no responsibility on that person, too. And there is somewhere along there, brain injury or no brain injury, that people are also still making their own choices to some degree. And we can't totally own that either. And so there are times where we do what we can and we acknowledge the, the disability, we acknowledge the problems, and we still say, yeah, you know what? This isn't moving. And, I, and I've tried, and I've gone all these other places, and it's, it's not happening. But I do think sometimes we hit trigger points and, and the ball goes up and, and maybe parents even while they're great advocates for her they might be a bit of a trigger point for her if they represent expectations and failure because expectations usually mean failure so it may be that that's really uh, even though you see them as advocates her perception may be very different negative absolutely yeah absolutely negative association sort of yeah every you know these and so sometimes the way we look at their, their support system and the way they look at their support system is really different. And sometimes stepping back and saying, okay, let me try and see it from your eyes for a minute. We can look at their support system differently and see why is what you're doing seem to be working from your eyes, as best I can imagine, and then where can I find areas of less resistance? Trying to come at it from your eyes. Because, again, we can say, well, they're great advocates. They've done all this stuff for her, and, and they probably are fa fantastic advocates. But to her, that might represent something very different. Because every time they advocate, I'm in a program, and i got to work, and then I work hard, and I fail, and I'm kicked out of this and kicked out of that, and then they put me in another program because they advocate so hard, then I fail that one, and so every time they advocate, all I do is fail. Whereas I'm home with this guy, and, you know, as long as he he's... No he has no expectations of me. Well, wow, is there a better world? You know, I have a young woman I'm working with right now, and similarly, tremendous, we've had a, a, a lot of issue around resistance for her. She's uh, an older adolescent. We're just looking at transitioning, and there's a number of uh, things going on for her, too, and there's been a lot of resistance within um, children's services and a few other places that she's been. And um, in the last six months, all of a sudden, things have settled out, and she's doing beautifully, and everything's fine, and I'm like... What changed? What, what happened? How come we went from fighting this girl tooth and nail, it felt like, to... Well, she went to live with a, an extended family member who had absolutely no expectations, so she spent six months sitting on a couch watching television. She's in absolutely no trouble. She hasn't been fighting. There's no arrests. There's nothing. She's doing great, but she's doing nothing, and there's no expectation. And so I'm not suggesting that's the way to go, but it was interesting because it was like, Boy, we were all, we all represented, we're trying to help her and we're rallying and she didn't want anything to do with us because you guys are all work. I go here, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm doing just fine. I don't know what your problem is, but I'm happy. And so, you know, we've had to try to shift for her a little bit our expectations and say, well, okay, we're, this isn't going to work for you for the rest of your life, but maybe we need to bring our expectations to a different place too. Maybe we need to back up the bus a little bit and say, okay, how can we meet in the middle a bit more? Because clearly we've been asking too much. 
because as soon as we removed expectation, well, totally, like I said, truly, sitting on a couch for six months, she was fine. So she's not just out there looking for trouble. It's every time we started to push, she would resist. So we're like, okay, can we take some baby steps and maybe find a middle ground here that gets you off the couch but not back in jail? Yeah. Um, I'm just actually wondering, like, if you're dealing with an offender, you see a little, you know, some of the red flags and, and start changing. Um, you think that that person would be a poor, <coughs> poor in assessment. Do you have any suggestions in bringing up that topic with with the offender, and even with the family themselves, especially the parents, is to, you know, I think that this would be an appropriate referral because it is a sensitive topic, especially if you, you know, bringing up to a mother. Right? Absolutely. It's an incredibly sensitive topic, and I and I really, in fact, the, I mean, you can go to a whole session on how to talk to biological moms because it is really challenging. Um, I, I often start by talking about, um, you know, where are areas of difficulty, what's going on, and what, how can we better understand what's going on for you? Why do you think this is going on for you? Tell me a little bit about your history and birth history. So I sort of walk it through from a... Uh, focused on that individual level and then get to the point where we say, um, so it sounds like, you know, things have always been kind of hard for you. It sounds like, you know, school was always hard and this was always hard and you've struggled with this and these have always been problems. Why do you think this might be? Do you have any theories? And kind of put it into their lap a little bit. Do you have theories? Do you have ideas? Nine times out of ten, I have individuals say, well, you know, I hit my head a few times, or a lot of times I hear kids say, oh, you know, I think my mom was drinking, or I think, because that's actually something a lot of them talk about now. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, and I think it's just because the information is out. So sometimes it will just get to that. No, oh, what makes you think that? Or why would you think that? Or you think your brain isn't working right. Why do you think your brain might not be working right? Because there are a lot of reasons why. It could be that you had your head. It could be that something happened when your mom was pregnant. It could be that maybe your mom didn't know she was pregnant was drinking alcohol or something like that. Sometimes that happens. Uh, oh, oh, well, yeah, well, my mom drinks a lot of alcohol. So, maybe. so I, I tend to be fairly gentle going in there. Yeah. Um, but taking them back by, why do you think? Why do you think? And an acknowledgement of things have kind of been tough. So I think there's a certain acknowledgement that you've really struggled. Things have been kind of hard, and you're really trying. wonder why that is. And, and I find sometimes, actually, when I have this conversation, the fact that we're trying to explore alternatives to you're a bad person is kind of enticing to them, right? It's like, it's not, this is all happening because you're a horrible person and, and it should all happen. No, no, maybe there's another reason. You know, I think you're really, I think you're really trying. I think you're good. I wonder why these kinds of things are happening. I wonder, um, that kind of takes them down a different kind of road of thinking and it reframes it for them again too. We're talking a lot about, I keep saying reframe today, but I think that that's a really core part. Um, so that's one thing I would suggest. Uh, if you have opportunity, if there is um, a birth mom that you have opportunity to kind of have contact with and talk to about, um, again, gently, certainly with no blame, uh, we need to be really careful of that because especially if we're going to talk to moms, it's pretty courageous of them at all to even come into our offices or want to talk to us at all. So certainly there, there's no blame and, and we're talking about, you know, the courage that it takes as a mom to, to even talk about these things is big and certainly a mom who's trying to look out for. And I don't know how many options you guys have to actually, I mean, that's one of the biggest issues that we have um, in addition to resources around diagnosis of adults is that history of their early childhood history and access to um, maternal report. If, if they are diagnosed with uh, being infected with FASD, is there support services as well for, for the parents? Depending on where you're at, so for depending on where you're you're living and what community, and again, I, I'll go back to the, you know I keep focusing on Jean's awesome suggestion, but again through the networks because there are definitely programs, and depending on the age of the child that you're the individual that you're talking about, whether you're talking about a youth or you're talking about an adult, there are definitely supports around, and there are services to support individuals who are parenting or um, dealing with or coping with. They're, they're, and there are more and more. That's actually a really exciting part. You know, while I say that there's a lot of information we don't know and there's a lot of um, conclusions that we don't have yet, what we do have is a lot more resources developing and a lot better networking of these resources in part because of these uh, networks in Alberta that have, that are becoming increasingly well-established and well-connected. All right.
Okay. Yeah, she was like, oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry to hop over your time. Um, uh, in the Globe and Mail on Saturday, yes. there was um, a, an article about some current research yes. using uh, computer programming and uh, the reshaping of the, the brain to the data to brain elasticity and brain injury. Um, so uh, that raises the question of um, whether computer programs are something that could be useful in working with uh, persons affected by FASD in a variety of different settings. That's a great question. I, I will reveal a bias before I answer it because I am involved in the computer process training. We're doing that actually here at, at, through the Edmonton Public School Board. So I reveal that bias as I start to talk because obviously I have one. But we don't know. What we do know is that there are forms of rehabilitation or intervention like these sort of programs that have had impacts in changing the way the brain functions for other populations. Other populations including individuals with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and other individuals with traumatic brain injury, so kids who have had a blow to the head and sustained a brain injury. So we know working with those two populations that there are some programs that we can do with kids that retrain parts of the brain. We kind of use the, you know, one of, the, one of the things, actually one of my colleagues always says, uh, neurons, which are those nerve cells we talked about earlier, neurons that fire together, wire together. That's sort of her little expression and I like it. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So by putting kids into programming where they have to do things over and over again with increasing difficulty, and they're very specialized tasks, but to the kids it's computer games. It's not, but it feels that way. What we're doing is we're wiring up specific areas of the brain by having them use those areas over and over and over again with increasing difficulty. Um, another analogy, which isn't quite accurate, but it kind of gets the same impression, would be weightlifting. How do you build a muscle? You start with a small weight, you keep going, pretty soon you have bigger muscles. That's what we're doing in terms of neurons in the brain and trying to grow those and develop them and strengthen them. Will these things work? Don't know. So part of the questions are the questions that we're asking around this research is, um, first of all, can we have any effect on the brain? And so we're doing brain imaging to sort of look at the brain and say, does the brain change at all? Do we change functioning? Just because we change a little bit of the brain, is this actually going to mean anything to somebody in their day-to-day -day living? Don't know. It might. Um, is this going to change the way they're able to function and how generalizable is it going to be? How much is it going to translate to different areas of their life? Again, we don't know. And those are all questions that we're asking and that we will be answering in the, in the next few months over the course of this research. So, um, or at least start answering it. We won't have definitive answers, but we're going to start answering it. And as you know, there are a few different programs and we're coming at this question from a few different directions. One of the things I really want to caution with this kind of research is it's exciting because it talks about things we can do to actually address that primary disability. A lot of the supports that we've talked about today, we're talking about dealing with secondary disabilities, trying to deal with you know, the other problems and create structures and supports to support the brain injury. This kind of intervention, what we're trying to do, is actually change the brain and support the brain. This is not a cure for FASD. We are nowhere, I mean, I don't even know that it's, it's certainly not even on the radar, the idea that we can do sufficient programming that is going to rewire the entire brain or anything. So I, I always offer that as a caution. We're not looking to, we're not offering a cure, we're not offering something that's going to work in a global way, but if we can see a somewhat improved function, if, if we can sort of just increase that brake power a little bit or slow down that accelerator a little bit, that might translate to function and reduce some of the problems we see, even just take the edge off a little bit, take the edge off a little bit. So that's kind of what we're starting with. So it's, it's exciting, it's exciting, but a lot still to be seen. For, for their life, for their actions? Um, well, that's a difficult question. I guess it depends on how you want to think. I mean, we're dealing with a brain injury. So are they ever going to be in a position where they're completely and totally self-sufficient and able to think in flexible cause and effect ways? No, no. Can you take responsibility? Can they say, I did something wrong? Possibly. Depending on the individual and the type of brain injury you're dealing with, do they fully understand? I did this and this caused that. Sometimes they may not. 
That cause and effect link may not always be clear. By doing this, this person got hurt? Really? No, I just did that. Yeah, but that hurt this person. No, I didn't hurt that person. I did that. There may not always be that direct translation. So um, what does taking responsibility mean is a big question. And I think there are different levels of responsibility. I think that to some degree you'll see people say, I did a bad thing that was wrong and I shouldn't do it. A lot of times when we talk about taking responsibility, we compare it to what we look at in terms of moral development in, in children and, and the ability to say, okay, this is right and this is wrong, not because I really get it, but because you tell me this is right and this is wrong. So I did this and it was wrong, and so I, I get that this is wrong, and it feels bad when I make you sad, and it feels bad when I let people down, so it's wrong, and I can take responsibility for its wrongness. Do I understand on this higher level that this is inherently socially irresponsible? And No, not necessarily. That's very abstract. Well, a lot of us maybe don't go there, but um, so I think it depends on what level of responsibility you're looking for. I think to some degree you'll get people who will have greater level of responsibility, and yes, I did this wrong, and people got hurt, or I'm not going, I don't want to do it anymore. But I think that for a lot of people there will be a lot of support, and the expectation that even if they do get to the point where they say, I did this and people got hurt, and I accept or feel some guilt or responsibility for that, doesn't mean that that will carry into my future behavior automatically without support, without support in my life, people in my life, through my life, my entire life. That doesn't necessarily mean that will keep me from doing it in the future because I won't necessarily recognize that doing this in the future is the same as what I did in the past. That's learning from that experience, which is not always going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely, when we talk about brain injury, it changes the playing ground a little bit. And then we add in the fact that it's not always consistent and it changes person by person. We really play, change the playing field. And, and sometimes it becomes a case by case, and that's where being networked and connected with people becomes really important to determine what's a reasonable expectation for this individual in front of me. Because it's not just a uniform plump when you see this. It's one thing you're seeing. There is a real mix of what you could be dealing with. So you coming up behind there? <laughs> Jackie, on behalf of the Cross Minister Committee on FASD, thank you very much for a great presentation on practice issue for probation officers. Um, just before we close, um, Aaron has on the uh, screen the CMC website. So to get to that website, it's FASD. Uh, dash cmc .alberta .ca. If you go under the tab for education and training right now, she has the FASD Service Network program up. But if you go under the education and training, you will find all the handouts, all the previous presentations that you can uh, see live, as well as we do give out DVDs of each presentation if requested. Um, just to note, uh, evaluations will be mailed to participants in the next uh, couple of business days, so be sure to uh, 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 sign in so we can uh, send them to you. Your feedback is actually really, really critical to keep this kind of initiative alive and well, especially in these times. Um, as you know, most of you are from Solicitor General and Public Security. Your CMC Cross Ministry Rep is Karen Cotton, and uh, she has two FASD network coordinators within your system that you may want to have contact with. Um, the next session that's scheduled is Thursday, February 11th from 9 to 11 with Annette Cutknife and Brian Mater on enhancing employability for persons with FASD. There's a poster that's been circulated, that's been updated, that's going around as well. So please feel free to attend and invite your colleagues. So thank you very much for a great turnout. <laughs>